I'm Tagvora. You may have heard of me. Not really, bro. Armenian gold Tagvor? Sorry, doesn't ring a bell. No matter. So in the city where I live, one of my favorite places to hang out is this ice cream parlor. They're only open seasonally, between spring and autumn, and they produce some really good homemade ice cream, sorbet, milkshakes, all that jazz. Being a pirate, of course I enjoy my steady dose of sugar, especially if it comes from one of my own plantations. Anyway, I think last year when me and my friend were hanging out and having a cup, he asked, Hey, you make videos about pirates, right? I said, yes. You should make a historical analysis on the Armenian gold pirate. I asked, who is the Armenian gold pirate? In 2008, the action-adventure film Pirates 2, Stagnetti's Revenge, was released direct to DVD and Blu-ray. At a budget of 8 million US dollars, it is considered one of the most expensive films ever produced in the adult entertainment business. Yeah, it's a porno. A 2 hour and 18 minutes long porno. I guess kudos to whoever lasts that long. Apparently it's been screened at a bunch of universities. Judging by various YouTube comments I've seen, this movie has a surprisingly large audience. Not for the smut, I think, but actually for the story and pirate action, most of which appears to be heavily inspired by the POTC franchise. A version with all of the NSFW content edited out has been uploaded onto YouTube. It's about half as long as the original runtime. I guess you can check it out if the movie sounds of interest to you. And yeah, as you might have guessed, the Armenian gold pirate, Takvor, is a character in the movie. Takvor, the gold Armenian. Firstly, we should address the elephant in the room. Or should I say, Armenian in the tent. Armenia is a landlocked country. So, how the hell is there an Armenian pirate? During the age of piracy, Armenia was divided by the Ottoman and Safavid empires the ancestors of modern Turkey, and Iran. Though the Ottomans were very much a maritime empire, Iran was more land-based, but other nations, including Europeans, would come and trade by sea. And though Armenia itself was landlocked, Armenian merchants would travel abroad and partake in the commerce of the wider region, especially in India. In 1688, Armenian merchants concluded a treaty with the English East India Company, granting them, quote, equal rights to use or benefit from all privileges that the company has granted or will ever grant to any of its entrepreneurs or any other English merchants. It allowed them to trade in all company ports, under the same terms available to any free Englishman. Armenians were a valuable asset to the English, as they had centuries of experience working in the region. Just like the English, they were also Christian. Most relevant to the history of pirates is an incident from 1696, during which a conglomerate of 30 Armenian merchants banded together in Surat, northeastern India, to purchase a 350-ton cargo ship, the Kada Merchant, owned by the Indian nobleman, Korji. If it wasn't multicultural enough, the deal was broken by a freelancing member of the English East India Company, the pilot also being English, with two Dutchmen as first and second mates, a French gunner, and the 90 or so crewmen all being Indians. The initial cargo of cotton was offloaded in Bengal, and traded for fine cloths like muslin, brown sugar, raw silk, opium, and a smaller quantity of iron, saltpeter, and a chest of gemstones, gold nuggets, and jewelry. On its homecoming voyage, the ship carried a passport from the French East India Company. Things were looking good, until the 30th of January, 1698, when the Cada was captured by a Scottish privateer, William Kidd. Since the Cada carried a French passport and England and France were at war, she qualified as a legal prize. The Armenians tried to buy the ship back, but Kidd refused, and carried her off as a prize. She was later taken across the Atlantic and abandoned somewhere in the Americas. Since the Kedah was owned by the Mughal Empire, who weren't on the best of terms with England, having recently been attacked by their pirates, the incident caused a huge uproar, in which Kidd was arrested and brought to London. One of the Armenians, Koji Baba, met Captain Kidd in his cell and tried to learn the Kedah's whereabouts. Kidd couldn't tell. So, Armenians did actually play a substantial role in the history of pirates. Apart from merchants, I don't know if there was a substantial amount of Armenian sailors just roaming around, but the possibility of an Armenian roaming around with European pirates certainly isn't out of the question. And European colonial pirates were quite diverse. They were often a huge mishmash of the usual suspects – English, French, Dutch, Spanish, Portuguese, various minorities like Basque, Bretons and Scots – 
but also more exotic nationalities like Danes, Swedes, Poles even, Italians, Greeks, Assyrians, Chinese. So an Armenian is not out of the question. There was also a substantial amount of Armenians living in Amsterdam during the period. Most of them had come as merchants, bringing goods from Iran and the Ottoman Empire. There is a large quantity of Dutch artwork from the period depicting Armenians, like this little statue of an Armenian with a monkey. Everything is gold. What a unique concept. The second most important question might be, why is Takor so obsessed with gold? His own answer seems to be that he likes the color. Yours might be that he's a pirate. It seems obvious. Pirates love the gold. Right? Look, are you really stuck on this gold thing? Yeah, what's wrong with gold, bro? Oh, absolutely nothing, bro. When talking about colonial American pirates, gold wasn't nearly as common as we were led to believe. Of course, much of the general plunder would have consisted of trade goods that could be sold. Slaves were one of the most valuable types. Pirates would also consume a lot of their plunder if they could. Stuff like cacao and sugar. But in the Americas, the most common precious metal would have been silver. When the Spanish conquistadors conquered Peru, they swiftly set up a shop in the mountain of Potosi, which in a few years would spit out the bulk of the world's silver production. The excessive harvesting of plate, as it was called, caused a bit of inflation, called the Price Revolution. Francis Drake was one of the first English pirates to take a massive haul of silver. It was said that each of his men was paid in a bowls full of silver. Fast forward a hundred years, and the first buccaneers to ravage the Pacific took an entire ship full of silver ingots. 700 to be exact, but they let it go, because they thought the silver to be worthless metals like tin. Imagine their disappointment when they found out. Of course, most of the silver had already been minted at Potosi into coins, before being shipped to Panama, from whence they spread to the rest of the Spanish colonies, or were taken to Europe by the galleons. Since pirates captured so many Spanish towns and vessels, the silver coins began to circulate and became the de facto currency of the Americas. It was common practice to clip off the edges and use the clippings as a currency in and of itself. Of course, all forms of precious metal were typically melted down as a form of money laundering. They were then made into new objects like candelabras or whatever and could then be melted down again and made into new coins. By the way, I don't see any large sack of silver for me. Well, I've got a large sack for you. Easy, bro! Naturally, there were Spanish gold coins in the Americas, quite a few. But gold was especially common in the Middle East, in Arabia, Persia, and India, the home waters of Takvor. Silver was less common in the East, and became a valuable trade commodity for Europeans when trading with the Indians and especially Chinese. Because they didn't really have anything which the Easterners desired. The English had wool, which... Mm, a bit too warm. And the Dutch had cheese? cheese? Not exactly popular among a continent of lactose intolerance. And it's no wonder that Taqua would look so favorably upon gold. Because even though silver was more common in the Americas, gold was still regarded as the universally superior currency, as it was accepted amongst everyone. How do you know that my favorite color was gold? Uh, just a hunch, I guess. When we first meet Takvor, he is hosting a slave auction where he is auctioning out several women as sex slaves. Auctions were a common process used by pirates to buy and sell items. Aboard their own ships, certain items of plunder like jewelry, watches, clothing and pets would be auctioned off by the quartermaster. If a sailor died, his possessions were auctioned out in the same manner. In port, privateer sold their captured prize ships at auction, going by the so-called inch of candle method. The auctioning lasted until a candle had been burned down to a mark on the candle. It is best explained through an anecdote. In 1659 in Port Royal, Jamaica, privateer Captain Morris Williams bought the price Avispa for £120. After proclaiming his price, a mark was put an inch down from the top of the candle, which was then lit. When no higher bid was received until the flame burned down to the mark, the ship became his. And of course, slaves were sold at auctions. But most often it appears as though pirates sold their slaves and all plunder directly to a buyer. It doesn't seem as though they hosted their own slave auctions. All of the sex slaves sold by Takvor appeared to be white. In the Muslim Barbary states, white Christians were enslaved and sold in this fashion. Maybe this is where Takvor got his merchandise from, being from a region controlled by Muslims, even though Armenians were Christian. 
It's not certain if all Christian pirates would have accepted this. Many pirates were vehemently opposed to the Barbary states and Islam, and used religious zealotry to support their own action against Arabia and India. Enslavement of white Christians was outlawed in the Western world. Of course, a lot of pirates didn't care, and there is some documentation of them keeping women as sex slaves aboard their ships. White Christians could also be indentured, a type of forced labor where a person is bound to a contract. They were often treated only marginally better than slaves, sometimes even worse. Some were kidnapped, some were indentured as a punishment for a crime, and some even sold themselves. The contract was seldom permanent, and, and some people really needed the money. A lot of Caribbean prostitutes were indentured criminals from Europe, having committed crimes such as bigamy. Treatment of indentured servants varied among pirates. Some had their own servants, others when encountering a ship full of indentured women, would liberate them. And since these women were often criminals, they would get along pretty well. It has to be mentioned that a lot of prostitution was without a doubt enslavement, in every regard except maybe the legal, and oftentimes in that department as well. Bro, bro, bro. Matey bros. A little bit on Takvo's speech. He has a propensity for using the colloquial bro. Usage of this colloquial dates back to the 1830s, but simply because a certain date marked the first recorded use of a word doesn't mean it might have been used earlier in a more informal context. But it must be noted that bro was initially used either in a religious context or a familiar one, same as how you'd call your sister, sis. The usage of bro, as we'd recognize it, did not seem to come about until the mid-20th century, when it was defined as a synonym for guy or fellow. You'd probably call someone a fellow in this context, but the English speech pattern of an 18th century Armenian may have been different. You're probably curious about Takvo's outfit. He wears a feathered tricorn hat with a bandana below wrapped around his head, a golden coat of some sort, a shirt below it, and his pants and shoes go unseen. He wears his sword and a baldric slung across the chest, and has several golden rings and golden teeth. Concerning his hat, the style is very much associated with pirates, but did not become popular until the rump end of the pirate age. Of course, we don't know when the movie is set exactly, it seems to be general 18th century. If you wanted to go for a historical pirate age, or 17th century style, going for a broad-brimmed hat, folded in some fashion, would have been more appropriate. But due to the vague time period, it can't really be called inaccurate. The bandana below his hat is very accurate. Kerchiefs, bandanas, etc. were worn by various individuals during the period below their hats, and it was common everyday wear for Caribbean gentlemen. Wigs were only worn on Sundays. In a lot of pirate media, you often see them wearing too many layers of cloth, which would have been too hot in the tropics. Takvor wears an appropriate amount, a shirt and a light coat. It would have been comfortable for sure. His golden coat is actually accurate. I was able to find two examples from the 1740s. This one is a golden silk damask, probably a banyan, a type of fine coat inspired by oriental fashion, so very appropriate for Takvor who's from the east, probably dwelled around India, and likes gold. Pirates wearing their swords in a baldric has become the go-to style for Hollywood. But in the European sphere, baldrics stopped being used for anything but the heaviest of swords in the 1670s. Afterwards, you'd carry your cutlass or small sword simply from a belt. But Takvo's weapon of choice is a scimitar, very often a heavy cavalry weapon, so maybe his sword is heavy enough to warrant the use of a baldric. And if you look at 17th century illustrations of Barbary Corsairs, they do wear large scimitars in a sort of baldric, albeit thinner than the baldric worn by Takvor. The scimitar was of course a favored weapon in the East, and were picked up by a few pirates. Captain Charles Swan was described as possessing a Turkish scimitar, and the remnants of a scimitar handle was found in the wreck of the pirate ship Speaker. It's very similar to Takvor's blade. Takvor has several of his teeth replaced by gold prosthesis. Dental issues were also rampant during the period, owing to crude dental care, rampant diseases, and diets heavy on sugar and alcohol. We can see that Takvor consumes generous amounts of fruit, however, which a lot of parts did, and his gums and teeth otherwise look healthy. So maybe he's been able to avoid the scurvy. Anyway, gold teeth existed in the period. Gold itself is an excellent material for dental prosthesis, since it is malleable almost immune to corrosion, and has a similar hardness to natural teeth. But 18th century dental prosthesis may not have been made of gold entire. You could also have porcelain teeth mounted on a gold base, or even false teeth, 
made from the bones of sheep, walrus, elephant, or you could even have actual human teeth from other humans. After a battle, it was common for looters to roam around the bodies and extract their teeth. For decades after the Battle of Waterloo, dentists advertised dentures made of Waterloo teeth. Pretty morbid. Moving on to his rings. I've previously been critical of Pirates wearing rings, as there is some secondary literature critiquing it. But since then I've encountered instances where a pirate captain, John Phillips, was documented by a witness as wearing two gold rings. Though it may still be true that rings are dangerous when working the ship itself, something which Tykvor probably never does. So all in all, Tykvor's outfit actually seems pretty authentic to the period, while still managing to portray a unique character. Of course, we never see his feet, and if he's equipped with these stereotypical Hollywood pirate boots. A similar sort of boots were fashionable among soldiers, officers and gentlemen in the early and mid 17th century. A few buccaneers might have worn them, but they faded out of usage in favor of the more practical shoe. The Spanish would continue to wear these similar stirrup hose, boots were worn by fishermen or sailors in a storm, by horsemen as riding equipment, and soldiers wore gaiters, which are sometimes confused for boots. Shoes and stockings were the most practical. It was also common to go barefoot, especially on land, but when Takvor jumps to the ground, it produces a sound as if he's wearing something heavy soled. It'd be my pleasure to have you as my guest of honor. Come into my solid gold tent palace. There will be girls, meat, and rum, mate, you It would be my pleasure, sir. Takvor makes his abode in a tent. Now, the pirates ever live in tents? Aboard a ship, it was very common to stretch out a sailcloth into a pavilion in order to provide shade against the tropical onslaught of Brother Sun. The sails could certainly be carried ashore and stretched into tents, as was documented. They were often used as habitats for craftsmen or to isolate the sickly. It was just as common, or sometimes even more common, to construct crude huts from locally foraged materials, light wood and palm leaves for roofing. So what kind of furniture would pirates have inside of their tents? Takvor seems to have a lot of pillows, gold items like an incense burner, precious cloths and carpets. He also has a Buddha statue and a throne. Fine cloths and items made from such cloths were excellent plunder because their weight to price ratio was very good. They could additionally be used to make clothes, to repair sails, and yeah, I guess you could use it as furniture. Pirates prefer to throw anything unnecessary and heavy overboard, including furniture. One group of pirates were described as jettisoning books and sleeping on the bare deck. Others had simple bedding, like a blanket or maybe a hammock. Pirate Captain Ned Lowe was described as having only chairs in his cabin. And Captain Jeremiah Cochrane had nothing at all, but would roll out a carpet for his guests to sit on. Common furniture would probably have been sea chests. A sailor's personal inventory, in which they kept their private money, spare clothes, and souvenirs of all sorts. It could be used as a table or a seat. Aside from treating his guests to, uh, female company, Takvor is also generous with fruits. I can see grapes, pineapple, oranges, and watermelon. Pineapples and oranges were grown in the Caribbean, and often looted and devoured by pirates and soldiers. And grapes could be found growing in the wild. All of them looked pretty much the same as today, but watermelons were completely different. The fruit we know and love today is the result of generations of selective breeding. A bit like the Von Habsburgs. In the 17th and 18th centuries, most of the flesh was white, difficult to open, and bitter instead of sweet. Tykvor also seems to offer hookahs from which to smoke opium. Opium was quite uncommon in the New World, where tobacco was much more abundant and, and smoked by pretty much everyone, especially pirates. However, opium was the name of the game in the Orient, being a very popular trade commodity, and often stolen by pirates but it's not well documented how often they smoked it themselves instead of selling it. The drug was seen as foreign in the West, and would never attain the same attraction as sugar, tobacco, tea or coffee. Ever since the Crusades, when opium first arrived in Europe, it was diluted with alcohol and consumed as laudanum for medicinal purposes. For an Armenian like Takvor, however, opium wouldn't be so strange, and it shouldn't be surprising to see him offering it to his guests. Any name that strikes fear into guts of men! Like Blackbeard, Blackboard, or Victor Stagnity. 
Tuck Horse states his ambition is to become famous and feared. He wants a name like Blackbeard or Black Bart, and hasn't really found a name that has stuck. The nickname Black Bart for Bartholomew Roberts is posthumous, whereas Blackbeard did go by that alias, and seems to have been the only pirate really conscious about maintaining a fearsome identity. Blackbeard maintaining a fearsome reputation may have been as much to keep his own crew in line, especially the slaves, since his enemies would not know it was him until after they had surrendered and been boarded by him. It was easy enough to know if a pirate ship was a pirate ship, but not so easy to know which pirate it belonged to. Contrary to popular belief, most pirates did not have iconic famous flags, which you'd immediately recognize as uniquely theirs. He did benefit from pirates overall being feared, and it seems as though this was his primary concern, rather than him specifically being an infamous figure. When members of Samuel Bellamy's crew were taken to trial and hanged in Boston, Blackbeard made a point of attacking Bostoners' ships as a form of punishment, and to maintain the fearsome reputation of pirates. What do you think about Goldbeard or Goldbart? Goldbeard. Sounds like a rabbi pirate. Now let's have some woman. Of course, Pirates 2 Second Day's Revenge is a porn movie, and Takwar invites his guests to partake in an orgy. Did pirates ever engage in such activities? When talking about sex in history, old times are often viewed as restrictive or prude, which was not really the case in the 17th century, when it was more akin to our modern sexual views than you might be led to believe. Both in the upper and lower classes, people engaged in premarital sex, had hookups, affairs, lovers, and prostitution was prevalent. The sexual tendencies of the period can be observed through some of the language, found in dictionaries and various documents. Here's a select few. Bundling, refer to intimate cuddling. Clip and kiss, common euphemism for sex. Blow, <laughs> Blow off the ground sills. Quote, to lie with a woman on the floor or stairs. Unquote. Buttered bun. Quote, lying with a woman that has just been laid with by another man. Sexually transmitted diseases were a huge problem in this period, especially syphilis which caused blisters and even severe deformations. A pirate was likely to lose an eye thanks to syphilis or smallpox. Indeed, it was very common for people to wear these black patches to cover up syphilis marks. One of the most common cures against syphilis was to pump a syringe full of mercury up your urethra. Yummy yummy. There were ways to protect yourself against STDs. The French, of course produced and exported condoms made from sheep intestines. One of these was discovered in the wreck of the pirate ship Widder. Unlike a rubber condom, it did not have as tight of a fit and had a lacing at the end for securing it. Maybe you could tie it up into a cute little knot or something. Of course there were people and institutions critical towards it based on religion. I can't say religious people because everyone during this period were religious but they weren't necessarily prude in the sense of being reclusive when talking about the act itself. Puritan love poetry can be quite explicit, but they dislike the sort of tendencies common with, well, sailors. And of course, pirates. If regular people engaged in a lot of sex, sailors did even more so, and pirates took it to a whole different level. It was no doubt common for them to enjoy the occasional buttered bun, as two sailors would often sign a maitletitch, making them share all of their possessions, women often included. And then there are descriptions of their various depravities, paying women a small fortune just to see them naked, using lit candles as sex toys. Yeah, Takor hosting an orgy in his tent is definitely within reasonable limits. Sadly, I was unable to view any of the sex scenes myself, so I can't really make a historical analysis of them. I tried to acquire the movie from my usual source, you know, the, well, how should you say it, the Cove of Buccaneers, but mm, I wasn't able to get it. There weren't enough, uh, how do you say, people who put uh, seeds in the ground. And showing porn on YouTube would probably have ended up in me being demonetized. So if you want to see more historical porno analysis in the future, maybe I'll get a Pornhub account or maybe even an OnlyFans. So yeah. And Tycho, the Armenian gold pirate from Pirates 2 Stagnetis Revenge? I never thought I would say this, but surprisingly authentic. Are you crazy, matey? You got it. 